the last two weeks, we've been talking about abortion, and we've been talking about it in a way that many have never considered the matter before, because what we've been doing is looking at the issue from a global historical perspective, because most of us already know what we think about abortion. But for most 21st century Americans, our opinions have been formed in a vacuum, in a protective bubble of sorts, which bubble has been shaped by the political environment in which we live. Because for most of our lives, for the past 50 years, since the Supreme Court handed down its decision in the case of Roe v. Wade, our opinions haven't really mattered. And that's not a political statement. I'm not saying that since Roe v. Wade, there's been no place for conservative voices on the question of abortion. No, far from it. What I am saying is that for the last 50 years, nothing anybody has had to say on the question has really mattered, not legally, not on the ground. Because though the Supreme Court of the United States isn't impervious to politics, it is and always has been the branch of government that is the least responsive to the will of the people and the least vulnerable to the winds of political change. And by design, the decisions of the Supreme Court are all but immune to both executive and legislative oversight, supersession, or interference. When there are only two legal ways that I know of to influence the court, one is through the cultivation of novel legal theories that may entice them to hear a case that challenges precedent. The other is through the slow process of attrition and the appointment of new justices. And the only way to override the Supreme Court on any matter is by constitutional amendment. And for this reason, decisions by the Supreme Court have a permanence that legislation and executive orders do not have. And for most of the last 50 years, Roe v. Wade has been an all but permanent fixture of the American political landscape. And because of that, because of its permanence, because of its indelibility, everyone living under its auspices has been free to say whatever they like about abortion precisely because nothing anyone says or does will make any real difference. For 50 years, candidates running for offices on all levels have been free to take stands, take positions, make cases, make promises, make all kinds of declarations about abortion, knowing that they'll never be held to account for what they've said because their hands have been tied. And when it comes to abortion, state lawmakers have been free to behave like high school seniors participating in mock legislatures, passing laws that they thought would be nothing more than symbolic protests, laws that they could use in their next campaign in order to demonstrate to their constituents that they were more ardently pro-life or more ardently pro-choice than their opponents. Laws that they never thought would ever come to bear on real people in the real world because they knew that that would be prevented by Roe v. Wade from ever actually taking place, from these laws ever actually being implemented. <laughs> Some of these laws were passed 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years ago by people who are no longer in office. Indeed, some were passed by people who are no longer even living. And many of those laws have been out there waiting like landmines to be triggered. And in addition to these, there are laws in a number of states which predate Roe v. Wade, which will automatically go into effect when the Alito decision is handed down. Now, at this point, I want to stress that it is not my intention with today's sermon or with any of the sermons in this series of lessons to get off into politics. That is not my aim. However, I assume that all of you are aware of the latest political developments on this issue, and I assume that this is an issue about which you care on some level. And I think it's not unreasonable for me to assume that 
Just as with most of your fellow citizens, you have considered this question only in the vacuum of the bubble of Roe v. Wade, which has shielded all of us from thinking seriously about the real-life consequences that our opinions on the matter might have. And now, now that the question of abortion is really going to be returned to the states, all of a sudden, your opinion does matter. All of a sudden, what you think can be communicated to your state legislators who can, who both can and will pass laws accordingly. And all of a sudden, all of us will have to live with the consequences of those ideas. Because all of a sudden, the question is no longer academic. All of a sudden, for the first time in 50 years, you are going to have the power to indirectly regulate the post-fertilization reproductive behavior of your fellow citizens. To make law governing the most intimate activity of your friends, neighbors, colleagues, co-workers, and acquaintances. And here I would remind you of the words of Absalom, who for years stood in a chariot on the steps of the capital, second-guessing the judgments of King David, intercepting those on their way in and out of court and telling them that if it were up to him, things would be different. As we read in 2 Samuel 15, 4, then Absalom would always add, Oh, that I were judge in the land. Then every man with a suit or cause might come to me, and I would give him justice. Now, we are not usurpers, as Absalom was. No, it will soon be the law of the land that the question of the legality of abortion will be returned to the people to negotiate. And I'm not claiming, as Absalom did, that my judgment on this question is better than anyone else's. No, in Exodus 23, 2, God told the children of Israel, you shall not be persuaded by the majority to do evil, neither shall you speak out to persuade the majority to turn aside. And I do not see it as any part of my job to tell you or anyone else what to think or how to vote on this or any other matter. But as a teacher of the word, I've, I do view it as my responsibility to give you the best tools I can give you to help you find your own way in regard to how to think about this issue, because thinking is my job and thinking clearly is my specialty. And thinking clearly about the question of regulating abortion presents us with unique challenges because for the last half century, most of our ideas on this topic have had no real world consequences. But now quite suddenly our ideas in this arena have very real consequences. Now quite suddenly what we think matters. In Habakkuk 1, 2 through 4, the prophet says, how long Lord must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why must I be a witness to this injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so the justice is perverted. Now that's the way it has seemed to be in the United States in regard to abortion for the last 50 years. But now, in our day, in our time, in real time, to the degree that this chapter of Scripture applies to our situation, we've reached verse 5 of Habakkuk 1, where the Lord gives his reply to the prophet, and his answer is this, Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. 
Beloved, if you had told me just about any time over the last 50 years that Roe v. Wade was going to be overturned, I wouldn't have believed you. And that's the case with most Americans. And for the most part, we've acted accordingly because we, like Absalom, have been sitting at the city gate saying, well, if it were up to me, I'd do such and such. Well, guess what? Within a very short time from now, it will be up to you. And it'll be up to you. That is up to the people in every state in the union. Because even if you live in a blue state where the abortion rights afforded by Roe v. Wade have been preemptively undergirded by statute, chances are there will be some level of restrictions or regulations placed on the practice. I mean, certainly at this time, there are only six states whose standing statutes impose no gestational limits on abortion, allowing the termination of a pregnancy up to the date of delivery. Alaska, Colorado, New Jersey, New Mexico, Oregon, and Vermont, and the District of Columbia. The other 44 states, as their statutes currently stand, they would limit the practice to the first months of pregnancy until fetal viability, with most states placing viability between the 22nd and 24th weeks of gestation. The two notable exceptions being Texas and Oklahoma, who have set the sixth week of gestation, a time well before viability, as their point of no return. The point is, however, that no matter where you live, your legislators are going to be considering this question afresh in the near future. And that's where the rubber meets the road in terms of your opinions or your convictions having any bearing on public policy. If you have ever wanted your voice to be heard on this matter, now's the time. But be careful. Be careful with the words of your mouth. Because now, more than at any time in your life, on this question anyway, you have a kind of power that you've never had before. Because within the near, very near future, your opinion could become law, which law will have profound effects on the lives of others. And that brings us back to where we left off last week. Because last week I established that for almost all of human history, in almost all cultures, under almost every religion in the world, going back as far as we can trace the question, all the way up to and beginning, uh, all the way up to the beginning of the 19th century, almost everyone in the world considered abortion to be a shame, but not a crime. It was considered largely a private matter between a woman and her health care provider, usually a midwife, and it was by and large not a matter of public policy. Period. Full stop. That's how things were from the beginning of human culture all the way up to the year 1800. Then, pretty suddenly, a hundred years later, by the year 1900, abortion was illegal almost everywhere in the world. And the question that I addressed last week was, why? How did that happen? Why did it happen? What changed? And actually, several somethings changed. The first of these was a major advancement in medical science. In the midst of the Industrial Revolution in the early 1800s, there was a major advancement in scientific thinking as scientists began to abandon inductive reasoning in favor of deductive reasoning. Now, the scientific method would be nowhere without inductive reasoning, because without inductive reasoning, there would be no place for intuition, and thence no serious uh, supply of hypotheses to test by way of deductive reasoning. Because just about every major scientific breakthrough in the last 200 years has started as a hunch, as inductive intuition, which hunches are then tested and subsequently proven true or false. Well, prior to the 19th century, the collective intuition of medical professionals worldwide was that Fetuses develop in three major stages, each roughly one trimester in length, from, from zygote to embryo 
to fetus. And that the beginning of the second stage of the development was marked by quickening, which indicated the moment of ensoulment, when the conceptus ceased to be merely a growth in the mother's body and became an incipient human being. But at the turn of the 19th century, doctors began to have greater and greater access to cadavers. And they began dissecting dead bodies on a regular basis. And among the subjects of these dissections were no small number of pregnant women. And this gave the medical community unprecedented access to the observation of the development of fetuses. And what, the, what they observed was that the process of gestation was more or less continual with no sudden surges in development. And from this observation, what they deduced was that working backward from birth, there was no natural break, no observable sudden change between a zygote and an embryo. Hence, they concluded, there is no qualitative difference, no change in valence between zygote, embryo, and fetus. And without a change in valence, there can be no ambivalence. Accordingly, they projected the moral weight of aborting a conceptus is the same on day one of pregnancy as it is on day 270. So what the scientific community ended up delivering to the world as one of its first post-enlightenment findings was moral certainty about the sin of abortion. And almost immediately, doctors and scientists across the board began advocating for anti-abortion legislation. Now, as I pointed out last week, this is quite a curious thing coming from the scientific community. Because since the Enlightenment, scientists have held steadfastly that science has nothing to say about morality in general because you can't get an ought from an is. But based on the first tenet of the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, from about the 1820s straight through to the 1950s and 60s and beyond, medical doctors pretty much across the board refused to perform abortions and did everything in their power to bring about the criminalization of abortion and the discreditation of abortion providers. And they did this by allying themselves with the government, insisting that doctors be licensed by the state, to practice medicine, and pushing for the elimination of all non-licensed healthcare providers, most especially midwives. Now that effort, which began around 1820, might never have gained enough momentum on its own to bring about the criminalization of abortion. But as the 19th century progressed, another phenomenon arose that caused the interest of world leaders and politicians to align with the interests of the medical profession. And that was a growing trend toward nationalism. Throughout history, nations have always sought to conquer other nations, take over their land and, and exploit their resources. But in the 19th century, there was a global surge in nationalism, which came with an intense interest shared by nations all over the world in building bigger and bigger arsenals and bigger and bigger armies. And that value carries with it a pressing sense in which bearing children is an act of patriotism. And in 1 Samuel 8, God tells us why this is a problem. Starting in verse 4, all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king, as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt till this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what a king who will reign over them will claim as his right. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people, 
who were asking him for a king, he said, This is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his right. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and his attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become like slaves. And when that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. You see, one of the features of nationalism is that a, a greater population translates into greater national wealth, greater national power, and that the state has an interest in that. Starting afresh in the 19th century, nationalism was on the rise, and globally, world leaders were equating the size of their populations with their military might, and this went on for at least 150 years, and this played no part, excuse me, played, played no small part in 19th and 20th century politics and lawmaking in the United States. I remember very well, as I told you last week, my eighth grade history teacher, Mr. Brazel, going on and on about the size of the population of China. And the reason for his concern wasn't his concern over overpopulation. No, the reason for his concern was that China's greater population would give them an advantage in a war of attrition. And in the 19th century, bearing children for your country became an act of patriotism. And in many countries, including the United States, abortion began to be viewed as an act of treason. Indeed, Theodore Roosevelt in 1894 said that women of good stock who refuse to have children should be considered unpatriotic race criminals. This was the sentiment all across the country throughout the 19th century. Criminalization of abortion accelerated from the late 1860s through the efforts of concerned legislators, doctors, and the American Medical Association. In 1873, Anthony Comstock created the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice an institution dedicated to supervising the morality of the public. Later that year, Comstock successfully influenced the United States Congress to pass the Comstock Law, which made it illegal to deliver through the U.S. mail any obscene, lewd, or lascivious material. It also prohibited producing or publishing information pertaining to the procurement of abortion or the prevention of conception or the prevention of venereal disease, even to medical students. Under this law, the production, publication, importation, and distribution of such materials was suppressed as being obscene, and similar prohibitions were passed by 24 of the 37 states. And by 1900, abortion was a felony in every state in the Union, though some states did have provisions in their laws allowing for abortion in limited circumstances. Now, most of that I told you last week. What I want to tell you this week is how that information comes to bear on the responsibility that each of us has for whatever influence we might bring to bear on our state lawmakers over the course of the next weeks, months, and years. Because in addition to reconsidering the current laws, which I mentioned to you a little while ago, there also remains before state legislatures the question of whether or not to allow laws that were annulled under Roe v. Wade to automatically go back into effect when Roe v. Wade is overturned. Because some of those laws, as I explained at the outset of this sermon, were passed with no real expectation that they would ever actually go into effect. And some of those laws date back to the 19th century. 
and were passed specifically to serve not the interests of the people, but the interests of the state. And those laws need to be reviewed and reviewed seriously before any of them are allowed to come back into effect. Now, there's a lot more I could say about this than I have time to say this morning, but I'm going to give you just enough this morning, I hope, to give you the basic idea that I want to convey. And then if you're of a mind to do so, you can go and research the matter on your own. But basically, this is the idea I want to leave you with today. When laws are passed, when laws are created, the crafters of those laws do so with certain legal principles and ideas in mind. Now, I am not a lawyer. I am not a legal scholar. I have not studied this extensively. But I can tell you a little something about two of those principles, about two of those theories. One principle of law is the idea of clear and present danger. And this is the idea that most 21st century Christians think is in play when it comes to laws banning or regulating abortion. Because as we reason, we imagine that what lawmakers are thinking is that abortion presents a clear and present danger to unborn children. Now, we're going to talk about that principle in much more detail next week. But today I want to talk about a different theory, a different principle of law that's actually much more prevalent when it comes to abortion law. Because if you go and read up on all the court cases that were brought to the Supreme Court in the 20th century and take a good look at the laws that were challenged in those cases and the theories under which those cases were argued, you'll find something very interesting. Because none of the attorneys general who defended the laws in question had any of the, in any of these abortion cases, up to and including Roe v. Wade, argued anything having to do with abortion presenting a clear and present danger to the fetus. No. In all of the cases involving anti-abortion laws, the attorneys defending those laws argued that the law in question advanced a compelling state interest. And among the laws so defended was the Comstock Law, which, as I told you, banned not just abortion, but contraception, and even literature about contraception to anyone even medical students. So the state's case was that the state had a compelling interest in as many women carrying as many children to term as possible. And not only should mothers not have a say in the matter, but they should not even be made aware that other courses of action exist. They should not have access to information about terminating pregnancy. And they should not have access to information about preventing pregnancy. Now, if that doesn't send a chill down your spine, I don't know what will. Because I don't know about you, but I can't think of any examples of any state taking that kind of interest in the birth rate among ordinary citizens that fared well in hindsight. I mean, the first that comes to mind is the forced procreation of the breeding camps of Nazi Germany, in which girls of good Aryan stock were forced to mate with boys of good Aryan stock, and their babies were raised by state-run nurseries. The second was communist China's barbaric one-child policy, in which families that had one child were forced by the state to abort any subsequent children in service of the government's compelling state interest in suppressing the growth of their population. Now, those examples are quite extreme, and I'm sure that there are good examples. I'm sure that there must be examples of state procreation policies that have been good, objectively good, both in a moral sense and in their practical outcomes. I just couldn't find any in the course of researching for this sermon. I don't want to make the mistake of comparing innocuous things to evil things and then drawing a moral equivalence. So I welcome input. If there's anyone listening to this lesson who knows of examples, 
of the state being involved in family planning and that turning out well, I'd like to know about them. But let's be clear about the words compelling state interest and what those words mean, because this is really important. And all you have to do is spend a few minutes studying the Bill of Rights to understand why it's important. Because the Bill of Rights assumes that the state is a clear and present danger to the people. And that the interests of the state, compelling or otherwise, run athwart those of the people. The First Amendment assumes that the state has a compelling interest in silencing the people. Which interest is a clear and present danger to the people and thereto establishes protections for the freedom of speech. The Second Amendment assumes that the state has a compelling interest in disarming the people, which interest is a clear and present danger to the people and thereto establishes and protects the right of the people to keep and bear arms. And on and on the list goes. Beloved, the Founding Fathers knew, they got it, they understood that the interest of the state always tend to be at odds with the interests of the people. And in Roe v. Wade, the defenders of the state never argued that abortion presented a clear and present danger to unborn children. They never argued that a fetus is a human being with human rights. They didn't go to court to protect the unborn. They went to court to protect the interests of the state. And what they argued was that the state had a compelling interest in obliging expectant mothers to carry their babies to term. And the Supreme Court rejected that argument, ruling that in this matter, the mother's interest in privacy outweighed the state interest in procreation. And they stipulated a short list of knowns and unknowns about the viability of unborn children but the unborn were never parties to that suit. Their interests were not considered. The only interests considered were the interests of the mother and the interests of the state. Now, there's a lot more to Roe v. Wade than that. We'll talk about some of that more in the weeks to come. But for the purpose of, of today's lesson, this is the point. The Bible tells us that any time the state takes an interest in procreation of, it, of the, the procreation of its citizens, evil will result. Nothing good will come of it. And history tends to back that up. And what I'm trying to tell you today is that right now, Today, we're standing at a crossroads in our nation's history. Unlike anyone for the last 50 years, since 1973, we are about to have the opportunity to shape this nation's laws in regard to procreation for several generations to come. And what I'm saying, beloved, is that surely we can do better than what has been done in the past. We have to. We can do better than the 19th century nationalists. We can do better than Teddy Roosevelt. We can do better than Anthony Comstock. Whatever laws are passed in regard to abortion over the course of the next weeks, months, and years surely must be based on something better something higher, something purer, something more noble than compelling state interest. Proverbs 31, 8 through 9 says, Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth. Judge righteously. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. You want to protect the rights of unborn children from clearer and present danger? You want to protect unborn children from the clear and present danger of being killed in the womb? Good. More power to you. 
But beloved, that's not the same thing as curtailing the rights of your fellow citizens in defense of a compelling state interest. Do the research. Know the difference. Be informed about the difference. And do your best to make sure that the lawmakers who are supposed to be looking after your interests know the difference too. That's my lesson for today.